Welcome to At Cronkite News, your social sharing connection where you choose the news. Facebook likes and shares, tweets, retweets, and favorites. YouTube views and subscriptions. We're watching you watch us. From our digital home at cronkitenews.azpbs.org to your television, web browser, or mobile device. Let's get a refresh on the top Arizona news of the week. President Donald Trump is proposing to pay for the border wall by slapping a 20% tax on imports from Mexico. Late today, White House spokesman Sean Spicer said Trump has discussed the idea with congressional leaders and wants to include the measure in a tax reform package. He says that taxing imports from Mexico would generate $10 billion a year. The news comes after the cancellation of Trump's meeting next week with Mexican President Peña Nieto. Nieto stated last night he wouldn't attend the meeting after Trump's wall announcement. But today, Trump told the GOP rally that the cancellation was a mutual agreement. Unless Mexico is going to treat the United States fairly, with respect, such a meeting would be fruitless, and I want to go a different route. And just one day after executive orders calling for 5,000 more border agents, Border Patrol Chief Mark Morgan has been forced out of the agency. An official says Morgan chose to resign after being asked to leave. Those living in border communities have their own thoughts about the wall. Cronkite News reporter Cassidy McDonald traveled to the border in Nogales, Arizona to learn about the community's reaction. In a speech to the Homeland Security Department on Wednesday, Trump stated his measures will enhance relationships with its southern neighbor that will save thousands of lives, millions of jobs, and billions and billions of dollars. However, in southern Arizona, many local business leaders, such as Sabrina Hallman, feel that the order will harm many businesses who rely on good relations with Mexico. When there are blockades that are placed and relationships that could be strained and feelings of antagonism. It makes business harder. It clearly does. This is Nogales, Arizona, right along the U.S.-Mexico border, where President Trump said in a speech to the Department of Homeland Security on Wednesday that he plans to increase security for both sides of the border, which includes 5,000 additional patrol officers, as well as tripling the amount of ICE officers. Mayor John Doyle of Nogales, Arizona, also feels that there is no need Need for a wall and that the most important thing for safety is a good relationship with our counterparts and with the people in Mexico because if we have their respect they abide by that it's when there's feelings in a negative way running rampant then you get other groups of people that don't follow the law as well take advantage of it. Both Mayor Doyle and Mayor Stanton agree the border issue should be handled by states dealing with it firsthand. Don't you think that cities are better governed by the elected officials and the leaders that you have here locally? I believe mandates from Washington are not the right way to go about public safety in our communities. In Nogales, let's embrace our diverse population. Cassidy McDonald, Cronkite News. Yesterday's executive orders Yesterday's executive orders from President Trump would also boost deportation for illegal immigrants with criminal records. The Associated Press is reporting that the Mexican president is considering canceling a planned trip to Washington following Trump's border wall order. Arizona Governor Doug Ducey told a group of reporters today that he's not concerned about relationships with Mexico, but he's pleased about the renewed focus on the Mexican border and security. I'm glad we're no longer being neglected by Washington, D.C., that our southern border counties are going to have some attention and some public safety. But are you concerned about the message it sends? We export a lot of stuff to Mexico. Are you concerned about the message the wall sends? I was in Mexico City 10 days ago uh, talking with their Secretary of State and business leaders. I want to continue to have economic development and growth. This is about public safety, drug cartels and human trafficking, getting uh, criminal activity off the border. But that, that's what uh, that's what I want to do. On the heels of Trump's plan to crack down on sanctuary cities, Phoenix Mayor Greg Stanton came out with a message of inclusion. He promised Phoenix will remain a welcoming city for all residents, but others on the city council don't feel the same way. Phoenix City Councilman Sal DeCicio says, quote, if the mayor feels so strongly about immigration issues, he should schedule a council vote on whether Phoenix should be a sanctuary city. Instead, his comments accomplish nothing and change nothing about Phoenix's immigration position, end quote. DeCicio went on to say that as long as he's on the council, Phoenix will not be a sanctuary city. 
Sanctuary cities across the nation are figuring out what their next steps will be. Cronkite News reporter Lauren Negrete takes us to La Puente, California, where city leaders say the answer is clear. The kids of La Puente are taking a tour of City Hall and getting a lesson on what it means to live in a sanctuary city. We've taken a stance. We will not provide information or data to uh, law enforcement or federal agencies such as uh, Homeland Security or ICE in order for them um, to come in our cities and displace families. President Trump's executive order threatens to take away federal funding from sanctuary cities, which Councilman Arguro says would cost La Puente $2 million. We would be able to um, look elsewhere to try and get some funding, make some rearrangements, but um, there will not be no major impacts in our city if we were to be defunded. Council members here at La Puente City Hall had already been considering drafting up a resolution to make the city a sanctuary city geared towards immigrants. However, community members came forward with their own version, making the resolution more inclusive to other minority groups. The La Puente Coalition meets at the community center to discuss their sanctuary plan. Gilda Ochoa is a member of the group responsible in making the city a sanctuary for immigrants. But they didn't stop there. We in La Puente support the community that lives here. We will not tolerate hate, discrimination. We had a broad, inclusive resolution intentionally. Their version protects religious minorities, LGBTQ, and groups they feel are targeted. More and more cities are declaring sanctuary. We're fighting back, and you need to realize who you're dealing with. Ochoa and the La Puente Coalition are moving forward now pushing to make their local school district a sanctuary campus. In La Puente, Laura Negrete, Cronkite News. Students at Arizona universities who qualified for Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA, are now living in limbo. Many fear President Trump will overturn the executive action that protects them from deportation. Reporter Adriana D'Alba explains what's at stake. People who have DACA would lose access to work permits, driver's licenses, even in-state tuition, and could be deported from the country they call home. It's been a long road for Elizabeth Perez, a justice studies major at ASU and the first in her family to attend college. She's a DACA recipient who worked years cleaning houses in order to afford tuition. And I became the first dreamer to work at the city of Phoenix because of my deferred action. And I left my house in a blazer, and my mom was so proud of me. She also worked on mobilizing voters during the last election when Donald Trump promised to put an end to DACA. But if DACA gets repealed, I honestly don't know what will happen. Elizabeth is one of more than 740,000 DACA recipients in the U.S. At least 30,000 live in Arizona alone, and many are students. We have a strong uh, desire at every level of the institution to be as helpful as we can to uh, create an, an environment where these students can have access to everything that the university has, has to offer. ASU President Crow and other university presidents around the country are backing DACA students. And so are professors. Nearly 1,300 professors from universities in Arizona and community colleges have signed this letter in support of DACA students. One of their requests is continuing to offer them in-state tuition. Despite the fear of deportation, the Arizona Dream Act Coalition reports an increase in DACA applications since Trump was elected president. My advice to those students who have DACA right now is to renew. As for but as the spirit of this country has taught her not to give up. Because I know how lucky I am to be in this country. And she's still looking to the future. After she graduates in May, Perez plans to go to law school. Perez actually didn't know she was undocumented until her parents told her in high school. Often these DACA students don't find out until they're ready to apply for that first job or go to college. In the Broadcast Center, Adriana de Alba, Cronkite News. We Arizonans enjoy Uber and Lyft to get around, and even Postmates when we're hungry. But Jolani Martinez explains the newest delivery app that's fueling the need of commuters in Southern California, which may be headed our way. As a part-time Uber and Lyft driver, Rudy Espinoza was caught a bit off guard by his next job offer. Uh, when I was asked to come on board, and they explained to me, the concept of what they had going, I, I found it kind of um, like unusual, 
Like, well, who would want to get gas? It began in 2015 when CEO Bruno Hazan was looking for a way to reduce the time Angelino spent behind the wheel. I started really purple that way on how we can like uh, help saving time for, for, for consumers. In a city legendary for its traffic, an app for a gas delivery seemed like a smart road to take for the tech entrepreneur. Requesting a gas refuel is as easy as registering your car, location, selecting the type of fuel you want, and how soon you need it. Time to pump. You must also keep your gas tank open in case carriers can't access it from the outside. Espinoza likes how the job can be done without bothering the customer. I just don't want them to know that I came and filled up their car. I just want them to turn it on and see it full and say, wow, you know, that's great. While convenient, for some, it's just not worth the service charge, which ranges from $3.99 to $5.99, depending on how quickly you need to fuel up. Yeah, if somebody comes to your car and puts gas in your car, you should pay him for that service. But it's not something that I would do, necessarily. The company hopes to expand soon, and Espinoza suspects Arizona will be on the list. But I think Phoenix would be a big city area where people come into work and they forget to put gas. And that's usually what happens. People come in, forget to put gas in their car, and say, darn it, now i got to go get gas. So instead of pulling into the station, simply pull out your phone for a price. In Los Angeles, Jolani Martinez, Cronkite News. Out with the old and in with the new. Downtown Phoenix officials are using solar-powered trash cans to help keep the city clean. Reporter Morgan Wheeler tells us how technology can save money and lead to cleaner streets. They are popping up around downtown Phoenix. They're really meant to kind of be more effective in terms of um, trash collection and we're excited to have them because the other great thing about them is they have a separate recycling bin. These solar trash cans need 15 minutes of sunlight a day in order to operate. Big bellies are meant to be more effective in terms of how much trash is collected. The bins can hold eight times more trash than a regular can. Big belly solar trash cans collect waste and recycling items. These trash cans are designed to limit the daily need of collection trucks. When it is packed, the bin sends a text message to Phoenix Public Works. Uh, the cool thing about these bins is they actually tell us when they're full, so we get live data that says, hey, your bin's full, come pick it up. The goal is to reduce the number of trash pickups from three times to once a week. These solar trash cans save time, money, and the possibility of lives. Any sort of public safety concern, we can lock these units down, and if anybody tries to tamper with it, it'll send a message to our cell phones and let us know, check this one out here, um, there may be somebody messing with it. There are now 15 big belly units downtown. After the test phase, the city hopes to expand these trash compactors to state universities and parks. In Phoenix, Morgan Wheeler, Cronkite News. Big Belly's trash cans reduced average collections from eight times to two times a week in Los Angeles. To see a demonstration on how the smart waste and recycling system works, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org. A team of researchers worked with the Tempe Police Department to study the effects of body-worn cameras. Cronkite News investigator Natalie Tarangoli learned about the study's early results. This video of a Tempe police officer chasing a fleeing suspect last October was recorded with a body-worn camera. An Arizona State University professor led a study on widespread effects of body-worn cameras. One of the things that we were very interested in in capturing was officer attitudes about body-worn cameras. The two-year-long study started in November 2015. Phase one meant half of the Tempe police patrol, about 100 officers, wore the cameras. I've conducted surveys with officers in a, in a number of different departments, and, and by far Tempe's officers have been the most supportive of the technology. So Less than 10 ASU graduate students made up White's research team. They interviewed citizens about the cameras, how they felt they were treated, and if it affected their behavior around the officer. The study done by ASU showed that most people approved of the officers using body-worn cameras. Nearly 90% of, of the citizens strongly agreed that the officers treated them with respect, treated them fairly, they were honest, they listened, they cared, and they acted professionally. White's team got feedback from nearly 400 people. Phase two just finished in November, so all patrol officers have cameras. Half have had them for a year now. In Tempe, the, the officers have been very supportive of the technology for the most part, and what we were able to document over time is that any sort of concern or questions they had really uh, dissipated after officers started wearing the cameras. 
Despite the widespread approval, the cameras are limited. At certain times, just because you have the front view of what's going on, you don't know what's going on behind the officer. You don't know if somebody's assaulting them, if somebody's pointing something at them from a different angle. As for the 10% of people who didn't approve of the cameras, White said their main concern with being recorded was privacy. Because something bad had happened and, and now they were concerned that this was memorialized on, on film. Tempe police wore cameras that record 30 seconds prior to actually turning them on. Double tap. It's now recording. But the American Civil Liberties Union of Arizona advocates for more. For an automatic turn on for a body camera, say when there are raised voices or um, when there's jostling of the, the um, police officer's body. White expects the results to be released this spring, giving insight on the impact of the cameras in areas like use of force and citizen complaints. I'm curious to see in, in Tempe whether there's a temporary effect on complaints or if it's going to, you know, that reduction is going to persist. In the meantime, Tempe police is doing what they can to increase transparency. We are trying to implement where officers, when they are in route to a call, to turn on, turn on the cameras to avoid forgetting. In Tempe, Natalie Tarangioli, Cronkite News. It is a familiar theme at the Arizona State Legislature each year. We're, of course, talking about the annual push for a statewide distracted driving law, an effort that has repeatedly failed. Yet, as Chantel De La Guia reports from Los Angeles, California voters have made their measure even tougher. Five seconds. Researchers say that's how long it takes for the brain to become distracted while driving which makes sense to millennial driver Taylor Villanueva. With the new laws, I've had to get um, a mount for my phone and put it on my dash. But it's also kind of cool because it's holding me accountable, so I'm not constantly looking at my phone when I'm at a stoplight. Chris Cochran of the California Office of Traffic Safety says it takes about four to five seconds to read the average text and another one and a half to two seconds for the brain to react quickly before an accident. If you're talking on a cell phone, up to 37% of the brain's activity that's needed for the act of driving can be moved over for the act of talking. With the increasing use of social media apps while driving, previous laws still allow drivers to make unsafe decisions. So California's distracted driving law has become even more restrictive. Drivers may only use handheld devices in their cars if they are mounted to the dashboard, don't hinder their view, and can be used with a simple swipe or tap. It has uh, filled that void which was caused because of smartphones and apps coming into being. State Senator Steve Farley has been trying to pass a no texting law for over a decade in Arizona. There have been dramatic increases in just in the last few years when you have that more attention intensive apps coming out. Which is why Farley says this year may be different. I'm looking forward to finally once we have a law in the books we'll join the rest of the country now. But for now the lawmaker will continue to look at California with envy. In Santa Monica, Chantal Delagula, Cronkite News. It was Aguila, my apologies. A statewide coalition of advocates demanding action to combat distracted driving is set to arrive at the Capitol sometime today. 94% of all traffic-related accidents are caused by human error. Self-driving car companies claim not having a driver behind the wheel can actually be safer. Reporter Natalie Tarangioli learned more about the future of these cars and a company that's test driving them in Chandler. We need to take the human out of the driving equation. Cars of the not-so-distant future are here. Couldn't have done much better myself. Autonomous cars are being test-driven all over the country, including Chandler. We improve safety by removing the driver. We're not drunk, we're not distracted. We can see 360 degrees around us. The average human can see about 120 degrees. Pull over planned. Futurist Brian David Johnson believes the self-driving car revolution will be big, even bigger than the advancement of smartphones. I mean, maybe you could look at the equivalent of, say, railroads or the railroad, because it's so tied not only who we are culturally, but it's tied to our technology. It's tied to our economy. Johnson says autonomous cars improve safety by removing the driver, which is initially a scary thought for some people. Early on, maybe eight years ago, when I started talking to people about self-driving cars, they were horrified by it. 
they would ask me questions that were basically similar to the robot apocalypse that they were losing their freedom, they were losing control. My dream is really that everybody's in a self-driving car. Um, I think it makes the road safer. I think that it gives people their mobility back. I also think it gives people their time back. Johnson predicts it'll be up to 10 years until the cars are more culturally accepted. For that generation who's now sitting in that car seat in the back seat, they're gonna be the ones who would ask themselves, why would you ever have a human drive the car? <laughs> The election of Donald Trump left many people unsure of what the future would hold. Cronkite News reporter Anthony Marroquin took a look at the expectations Navajo leaders have for the incoming administration. For Native Americans, like everyone else around the country, political ideologies vary from tribe to tribe. But one thing both sides can agree on, it's time to work together. The Navajo code word for hand grenade was no mercy. Peter McDonald Sr. knows a language that most people will never hear. No mercy in Navajo means potato. Oh, okay. Because yeah. hand grenade looks like a potato. McDonald was a Navajo code talker with the Marine Corps during World War II. In those days, he was stationed in the Pacific Theater to help defeat the Japanese. But today, his fight is at home. The Navajo tribe, like most Indian tribes, we're all very conservative. McDonald is a strong supporter of President Donald Trump, but that hasn't been the most popular opinion among the Navajo. So as I've always said, that, uh, that we, whoever is elected, we as Navajo Nation will work with whomever. Navajo Nation President Russell Begay said he felt Hillary Clinton really connected with the common person and would advocate for Navajo on all level of government. But he added that his nation was flexible and would work with the Trump administration. And we felt that, uh, that he was not really connecting uh, with who we are as a nation. But in McDonald's eyes, there's nothing to worry about. Having a Republican in the White House is enough to start celebrating. In Navajo means do it yourself to, to be what you want to be. And that's this Republican philosophy. BK told us he's especially excited about the president's plan to bring companies back to the U.S. because he says that Navajo taxes and regulations are comparable to those with Mexico and other countries. In Washington, D.C., Anthony Marroquin, Cronkite News. After winning the Arizona Rock and Roll Marathon this year, Flagstaff's Tommy Puzzi became the first ever back-to-back -back winner. But as Cronkite sports reporter Jake Garcia tells us, there's more to Puzzi's story than simply running success. Tommy Puzzi's days start with 5 a.m. wake-up calls. Most often to study for a physical therapy doctorate he expects to complete at NAU this spring. Yeah, that Scandinavian model of a 30-hour work week <laughs> looks pretty good. Other times it's to shovel the driveway so his wife and three daughters aren't snowed in all day. By 7 a.m., he begins an 11-mile commute on foot to the rehab facility where he works. You know, running 130 miles a week and then trying to have some kind of <laughs> meaningful relationship with not only the kids but with, with my wife. Of course, it could be tough sometimes with the sacrifices and the time that he's gone, but I think just alone him pursuing his dreams and having our children be able to see a parent that's so dedicated to that goal, I think is just incredible. Once he finishes his degree, Pusey will turn his focus to the pursuit of a childhood dream, the Olympic trials for the 2020 Tokyo Olympics. Ditching the knee deep snow back in Flagstaff will be an important part of Pusey's training for the Olympic trials. His workouts will become more pace focused, which means shedding a few layers of clothing and finding a lower elevation, like 30 miles south here at Camp Verde. He runs to school and back every day, which is great for volume, uh, but it's not necessarily great for, for speed. So if he could find a way to get out and do some real specific workouts specific to the pace that he needs to run to get to the trials, I think that would help him. Two hours, 19 minutes is the eventual target time for Pusey, a pace he was just over at his recent win. In Flagstaff, Jake Garcia, Cronkite News. Pusey said he plans on racing again in Arizona in February, then the Boston Marathon in April, followed by the Chicago Marathon in October. Now, here's an at Cronkite News pick of the week, a favorite from the Cronkite News staff. The Arizona Department of Health Services is inviting new employees to work, but it's not who you might expect. Cronkite News reporter Alexis Stewcraft shows us how babies are improving productivity.
This may seem like your typical work environment. However, one new trend is changing the ordinary for some Arizona government employees. I think it's been a really uh, great opportunity to be able to bring her into work. She's been a good um, contributor to our team. Six-month-old Caitlin is at work every day with her dad, letting them bond more frequently than if she was at an outside daycare. Having the interaction with her, having that one-on-one -on -one time is, is beneficial for us. And Caitlin isn't the only baby rolling around. Three-month-old Beckham also joins her mother at work. The the thought of having to not have her with me when my maternity leave ended, it would have been so much to be able to handle. However, having these babies at work isn't all naps and playtime. How am I going to make sure she has everything she needs, but how am I also going to make sure that my job has everything that I need to do? And getting those things both in order, I think, is definitely hard work. We coordinate nap time, feedings, and uh, diaper changes between my meetings. These babies bring a unique dynamic to the workplace. And you could see the office dynamics change. People are happier, um, workplace morale you know, increases when there's the baby around. It brings out these things in people that is just so neat to see. Sadly, these babies don't get to stay forever. Babies up until six months, they mostly sleep. And so, you know, they're not very active, they're not mobile. At about six months is when we've noticed that that's when it's harder to continue to do the job while the baby's still at work. Which means Caitlin will be graduating from the program soon. She's gonna be retiring next week, and uh, I think it's gonna be a, a transition for me at least. And she will be missed by all. In Phoenix, Alexis Stukrath, Cronkite News. Cronkite News tracks your likes, tweets, and shares from all our social sites to bring you this news special at Cronkite News, our weekly refresh. Join the conversation so you choose the news. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, subscribe to us on YouTube, and log on to cronkitenews.azpbs.org for top Arizona stories anytime.